Hello and welcome to Thought Provoking Tech. I'm Zach and in today's episode of Compute, I'm going to be talking about Paperspace. So Paperspace is a unique and very interesting cloud desktop platform that's putting together a very solid uh, product that has a lot of unique features while they might alone, those features not, might not be unique to uh, the cloud computing market in general, but the complete package that Paperspace has put together is a very compelling option. Uh, in this video, I'll kind of go over some of those very cool features that Paperspace has put together, the pricing of Paperspace, and uh, kind of giving you a glimpse into why it is so great in that realm too. And finally, wrapping up with getting started into uh, Paperspace and deploying your very first Paperspace computer, which is very quick and it'll probably take a heck of a lot shorter than this video will in general because it only takes uh, you know a handful of minutes to deploy. Uh, so, without further delay, let's go ahead and get started. Alright, so when, when you first make your computer uh, on Paperspace, it does take a little while to initialize and provision the resources, but after that, it's actually pr quite speedy. So, I, for instance, I have my standard uh, computer that you can kind of see here to the left. Uh, that's running the standard performance tier uh, that I'll get to in a little bit later. And that actually said that's up as the monthly plan. So I leave that running all the time. I have two-factor authentication set up on my plan. Uh, so from the moment of logging in to entering two-factor authentication to actually running Windows in uh, either in the desktop client or in my browser, it takes about 10 seconds when I leave it on. Uh, that increases to about 45 seconds to a minute if the computer is in the shutdown state and it has to start up, boot up, and then you know go through the login process, of course, that'd be the same for it, that too. So very quick initialization after the fact of actually creating it. But since it does take a little bit of time to create it the very first time, I wanna go ahead and walk through creating one uh, for the first time. So let's go ahead and expand this a little bit bigger uh, to give you a little bit bigger insight of what's going on. And then we'll make it smaller again while we're wait, waiting for it to initialize and kind of going over some of the features of Liquid Sky. So as you can see here, the first choice you have to make is the uh, whether you're going to be in the East or the uh, California location. Uh, it's only in the U.S. at this point in t part in time. Uh, I don't know, like if you're in Canada, at least Southern Canada, if you can sign up, maybe I don't know if they're restricting it just by like if you don't if you're living in Canada, you can't sign up at all. Or if you could, and you'd still be able to use it, because I mean, the eastern one is actually pretty far up north, so it might probably be pretty usable. I'm right in the middle, and I can use the, I've only tested on the eastern, so I can't, you know, I'm assuming it's the same for both of them. But the eastern one works pretty fine just for me uh, in, in the central. I would like to see them get another one in the future. Uh, but, you know, it works pretty good from here. Uh, the only thing I'm concerned about is gaming. That's one thing that Liquid Sky really promotes heavily is, the very low latency and with increased distance you will have increased latency so that'll be something i'll be looking at deeper into the future when i kind of look at paper space for those that are interested in gaming beyond that you have a couple of different os twists to make whether you're going to be running windows or linux to begin with uh, with windows 10 or windows 7 you have all the different uh, performance options available you can also bring your own license if you're like in an enterprise environment there is no cost reductions to doing that so there's no reason to go out and buy a Windows license and use your own if you're just an individual user because you're not going to save money over time. Like if you're planning on using Liquid or uh, Paper Space for, you know, two or three years down the road, uh, there would be no benefit to you to do that. Otherwise, there might actually be a reason to go do that. Uh, you can also run Ubuntu, but it's kind of looks like it's focused more on the professional market with only the one, uh, machines with the dedicated GPUs in them being a, a viable option. Uh, one th quick thing on the machines, I'm going to kind of talk about the pricing in different tiers later. But the GPU Plus, you can't sign up for that, and you, I can't click on the P5000 uh, right now at all. Um, it's supposed to be it's supposed to be available, but uh, the GPU Plus, you have to essentially submit a re uh, request uh, for it. Uh, so just don't you know go and sign up and expect to be able to start running on the GPU Plus, you know, in 10 minutes. And be then be dismayed when it might take a couple of days from the preview your request. I made my account count about a month ago, but I just now I'm getting into actually making the the uh, cloud computers uh, for paper space because I'm just now getting uh, 
into you know that part of the project that I wanted to start testing it and seeing if it was a val viable option. Uh, but I will go into these machines and the performance of those machines a little bit deeper and over time I actually do benchmarks and stuff it later on. Uh, one important thing you have to make is decision you have to make is your uh, your storage. Uh, for instance, you have anything ranging from uh, 50 gigabytes for five dollars a month uh, to two terabytes at forty dollars a month. So I'm going to run through those real quick. You get 50 gigabytes at five, 100 gigabytes at six dollars, 250 gigabytes at seven dollars a month. That's kind of the sweet spot of starting out. Uh, 250 is uh, 250 gigabytes of storage is pretty good uh, and on the team plan you can have shared drives so you might not need as much on a team plan of course uh, 500 gigabytes you get ten dollars for ten dollars a month uh, for a terabyte is 20 and two terabytes it's forty dollars uh, you have two fun little options beyond that uh, auto snapshot and public IP auto snapshot is pretty much an automatic backup you can do that on an hour by hour basis, a day by day basis, a week by week basis, and a month by month basis. And you can specify how many you want to keep from one to 10. These do cost uh, based on, essentially it's based upon uh, the storage space of your drive. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you'd have, I'd have to look at the pricing for that specifically, but it is based upon your, your, your storage space. Uh, one final thing is creating or paying for the payment. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move that to a different window real quick because it keeps my credit card and I don't want it to show that. <laughs> um, so I'm creating, I just click the button to create it and it's be a good judge on how long it takes to actually uh, initialize the machine. So you can see it now says provisioning. I'm going to go ahead and make that smaller. Keep it over to the left so you can see it still. And let's go ahead and go over to the pricing for uh, paper space while we're waiting for that. So uh, you're, you have three main tiers that you're going to be accessible to, to the moment you create an account. These are your Air, your Standard, and your Pro. Uh, now, when I first started restructuring paper uh, space, as a, a potential thing for both work and for me personally, uh, I kind of like scoffed at the Air plan, like uh, that's kind of worthless. Um, but then I kind of thought about it and gave it a little bit deeper thought and kind of looked into some of the features of paper space and have two good uh, viable options of why the airplane could still be viable. So the first is uh, there is desktop apps for Windows, Linux, and Mac. So for Windows, Mac and Linux users, this could be a very cheap thing that you run on an hourly basis. Uh, and in all use cases, I only see it's really being used on an hourly basis uh, simply because of the performance cost. Uh, but anyways, I di digress. Uh, the Airplane could be a viable option to running software that isn't compatible on your host OS for those two use cases. So it's not a super high performance, but if the app is a little bit older uh, or essentially isn't performance hungry, you can still run that in a Windows environment, but still have your your environment of choice, whether that be Ubuntu, uh, if you're more interested into like the security or the privacy concerns, that people have with Windows and the Windows 10, or you know Mac OS if you're a, an Apple fan and prefer running on a uh, you know the MacBook Pro or the, one of those uh, in you know in that line the standard Mac uh, books or the MacBook Pros. So uh, I do see it viable for that. Another use case is in mobile. Uh, there aren't mobile apps, but you can use uh, this straight from the browser, and it's compatible with Safari, Opera. Of course, uh, Chrome and Firefox and Internet Explorer. They don't mention Edge, but I will look that up in the future and do a little more research on that. Uh, there are, you know, use cases for people that are very mobile, but you might want to have a Windows environment it, while being super mobile. Uh, for instance, I, there, you know, like Office 365 is used pretty heavily in the Office setup. Uh, you can run quite eff effectively on, a, you know, your iOS or Android device. But like OneNote, for instance, there's a lot of features of OneNote that aren't available in the mobile app or the web app, even for that part, that just don't like, you know, I, there's just some extra features that aren't available and Excel to that great degree too. Uh, now on the phone, it's not a very good experience. You have a you know, very small screen 
And beyond that, Android kind of scales your resolution. Even though these phones nowadays have super high resolution, they scale the resolution uh, so that it's actually much smaller than this phone's native resolution. This is done in part from multiple different reasons. In part, if you had, if you displayed the browser in the native resolution, everything would be so dang tiny, you'd be constantly zooming in. However, in the use case of paper space, it bases your, the resolution of your remote machine based upon the resolution of your phone. Your phone will report the scaled resolution, not the, the displays, the, not the pure screens, actual, the resolution that is possible of actually rendering. So the paper space is a super small resolution and it's not really useful because of that. Now, taking that to an iOS uh, tablet, an iPad, or you know, an Android tablet, uh, I have the Asus Zen Pad, I think it is. Uh, anyways, that's where it becomes actually quite usable. But like I was saying, the mobile versions of some of those apps just aren't up to par. Uh, so I could see the Air being used for like just running OneNote. The OneNote desktop app uh, for you know is, is amazing. We use it very heavily in work. We use it all the time in my daily life. Uh, so I see that being very useful for those use cases. Uh, you, should, you should need something a little bit more, just a little bit of power. You don't need a ton of power. It's very cheap, um, and you know it's a viable option. However, bumping up to three more cents an hour, and you see the standard, and that's the thing, the plan that I think it really has a lot of potential. It's not much more than Air. Uh, even running it monthly, which we'll get to in a little bit, it's not much more. Uh, so it's only three, 30 cents more a minute or an hour. Sorry about that. Uh, but it, increase, it has some very important performance increases. It doesn't increase your video RAM, which is limited to 512 megabytes still. Uh, but it does let you it does bump it up to four logical processors, which is double the processing power. And from eight gigabytes of RAM to uh, from four gigabytes that the Air has. So your Air, you have four gigabytes and two logical processors. With the standard, you have eight gigabytes and four logical processors. That's essentially the difference between an i3 and an i5. Now keep in mind yeah, your your clock frequencies of your i5 and your i7, especially, are high clock high clock frequencies, which is going to be important in, in certain applications, which aren't really don't really expand well over multiple logical processors or threads as you're, they're normally called. Uh, so, like some games, for instance, don't do well on multi-threading applications, are good multi-threading applications. Uh, a lot of 3D or professional software is very good about multi-threading, like uh, your Autodesk and things like that. They scale pretty good as you know, your number of threads or logical processors increases. Uh, the standard I see is kind of being the, the starting point of when you can actually run a lot of different apps. So like I said, it's kind of compa comparable to an i5. So if you have like a Surface Pro 5 in the or Surface Pro 4 in the i5 range, this is kind of be very compatible with what you have. And, you know, that's like a thousand dollar device. So just keeping that in mind for uh, let's turn on the monthly real quick for twenty four dollars a month. Uh, that's with 50 gigabytes of storage. So you can say uh, uh, you can bump that up to like twenty six just for 250 gigabytes to make it actually quite usable for you know $26 a month you have essentially what it equates to a thousand dollar device now the surface pro fours are quite expensive uh, and you can build a desktop for much cheaper of course but that's you know you're kind of having a very mobile option it's a very cool device but you can put this on a much cheaper Android tablet and possibly have a very similar experience um, so there's a lot to really get at uh, here there's a lot of pros and cons you do need internet connection of course so it's not a purely always mobile option but it is getting to the point where i see the future going and our devices will essentially be the portals to our you know the, to the data centers or to the cloud uh, as it's always called and all the processing power will be offloaded so that way our devices are essentially just screens uh, with big batteries so you never have to plug the dang things in uh, probably wireless charging everywhere um, so they just draw power from your natural environment and, uh, and that, that, that's that uh, now moving on to the pro plan we go up to 20 gigabytes of RAM massive improvements there eight logical processors and a two gigabyte GPU the pro plan is as aptly named is really aimed at professional users in addition 
that's where I, you know, you can probably do some 3D CAD video editing. It's going to be a little clunkier on the standard, but you could probably pull it off. It might not be as efficient, but the Pro is really, really going to shine on that. Uh, the GPU Plus plan is actually very price competitive, though, and I'll get to that in a very quick bit. But the cool thing about the Pro, and while it's actually aimed a little bit higher than the GPU Plus, is because it is upgradable. I haven't figured out how to do that. It might be one of the things you have to have special permission to to do actually perform, or it might be something you have to do the request. But you can upgrade that 20 gigabytes of RAM, which is staggering for almost all, most use cases that for you know very high end professional. Uh, setups is you can upgrade that to 120 gigabytes of RAM, up to 32 logical processors, and up to a 4 gigabyte GPU. So that's where we're really getting to a point where that can be a very powerful render machine, uh, assuming that it's like using logical for rendering, a very powerful like database uh, server, you know, running a SQL database or something along those lines, or anything like, you know, the server things where you have 120 gigabytes of RAM. You know, you're going into very high end computing. Uh, I have no idea what the computing, you know, the, the hourly cost of that would be. But, you know, you're getting to the point where it's a very powerful computer for very cheap. These are actually very competitive prices to AWS. Uh, I believe, like, the GPU Plus, which is kind of similar to the GPU uh, plan on AWS, I think that's around, I want to say it's like 75 cents an hour. So I'll do some comparisons probably in the future, breaking these down to different services and how the price compares. But just from memory, these seem to be very, very competitive prices for the performance that you're getting. And that's one big selling point with uh, paper space. Another, of course, is the ease of use. But let's go ahead and talk about the GPU Plus plan real quick. The GPU Plus plan essentially uh, goes up to 30 gigabytes of RAM, eight logical processors, and an eight gigabyte CPU, GPU that is dedicated. Uh, so the difference between that, the GPU Plus, and the P500 that we know of right now is essentially the GPU, uh, the P5000 increases that dedicated GPU to a 16 gigabyte GPU uh, as opposed to an 8 gigabyte GPU. And the, the P100 is something that's not available yet, but I think it has a much higher uh, performance uh, GPU uh, compared to the P5000. Um, but if you look at the GPU Plus and the Pro, if you're not planning on actually upgrading, the GPU Plus is actually a very, very viable option uh, because it's five cents less an hour, but it has an eight gigabyte dedicated GPU and 10 gigabytes more of RAM, uh, which is is a lot of RAM. <laughs> There's a, a lot of softwares that won't really even take advantage. Oh, as you can see, our machine has just now finished provisioning a second ago, and it's now loading. Uh, very quick, soon it'll be re it'll say ready instead of. Uh, loading and that this essentially means windows is starting up so once it, when it turned from pink to blue uh, which you might have to rewind a little bit if, if you didn't catch that uh then that essentially meant that it had finished kind of provisioning the resources in the server and it's like you had hit the start button on windows uh so it'll take a little bit to start up this is like the 45 seconds to a minute it might be a little longer on the first startup i don't remember uh if yes or no um, but as I was saying, the GPU Plus is a very good option if you're interested in, you know, not 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 really planning on upgrading the pro, pro plan. So keeping that in mind, uh, for 45 cents an hour, you could have a very powerful thing that's good for gaming, uh, high, super high in CAD applications, uh, any type of visual services such as 3ds Max, Maya, Photoshop, a very powerful machine that's going to be able to do whatever you can do for for the most part uh in the sense of getting away from, away from the you know not talking about machine learning uh real quickly it says it's ready now so once it's ready you can actually click on the little windows icon it'll bounce up a little and you can actually click launch and launch it directly into your browser so let's go ahead and do that and get that launching real quick uh so while that is actually launching and loading in the browser real quick uh let's go ahead i think we're done here let's go ahead and go to the monthly real quick though uh and you can see that the gpu plus increases dramatically over the pro plan so if you are planning on using this very heavily in like a business setting that's where the pro plan still has it value uh even though it's m more expensive on hourly it is cheaper on the pro, uh the monthly plan because the gpu plus plan has a, a dedicated gpu so it's, i'm assuming it's a much more expensive for them to upkeep 
and I assume you'll be running it all the time. In addition, the GPU that's in the GPU Plus plan uh, is capable of doing very uh, for, for is very capable of doing the renders, especially those that are GPU bound, which is a lot of the professional 3D applications are. I know like Autodesk Inventor, its rendering built-in rendering is CPU bound, but like Maya and 3ds Max, things you're going to be using for movies uh, and you know a lot of your rendered CGI scenes, both in movies and ads and you know product demonstrations. Uh, and then product, you know, placement or product ads, those are all going to be done, you know, very capable of doing on the GPU Plus, and that's probably why there's that massive price spike because that's where you're getting into the professional, you know, cost, and you know, something comparable on Amazon is going to be very expensive too. But you know, that's where the standard GPUs for monthly prices, uh, they're still very competitive for twenty four dollars a month. You can easily have a standard computer, you know, bump that up a couple dollars for the actual uh storage price and you're at it with a very good computer for you know not a lot of not a lot of money so uh without further delay let's go ahead and expand this scene you can see that as i was saying earlier based on your device's resolution so it actually had to resize when i increased that from a little b window to a big window uh so you there is one way to kind of restrict that resolution a little bit and it is through gamer mode and it'll kind of somewhat make it to like standard resolutions but it still does resize to a degree based on your d display it just doesn't do like it doesn't fill the display 100 uh, percent you can also go in full screen mode in the desk uh in the uh, browser so essentially the it looks like it's you're real, literally running windows in that screen because it goes edge to edge uh so that's very cool uh that it can it, that it can do that but since we're just doing some demonstrations, I'll run through kind of this whole part, uh, kind of customizing paper space and all the different options later on down the road. But I just wanted to kind of go get a, like an introduction to paper space real quick uh, and some of the features that it has. Uh, so I'm going ahead and shut down real quick and go back to uh, the um, the console. So. As that's shutting down, let's go back to the console real quick. And uh, let's see, it says it's loading. Uh, so a couple things here. Once you have created your machine, you can still create snapshots. So you have the ability to automatically make snapshots based on a period of time and keep so many of them. But you can, if you don't want to do that, you can still create them manually too and manage those uh, snapshots. Beyond that, you have capabilities to open your computer if it's already started. You can shut it down. And restart it if a glitch happened and you're stuck or something. Uh, beyond that, you can have your auto shutdown frequency for uh, plans that are hourly. I recommend setting that to an hour uh, so that you don't walk away and forget to shut it off and close your browser or something and then be stuck paying for you know 24 hours for only using it for 30 minutes or something like that. Uh, beyond that, um, you can also upgrade. You can deactivate, which deletes it. You can, it can still assign it the public IP uh force it to shut down again i don't know it's taking so long um shutdown process does take a little bit of time but that's not really uh too important because once you're shut down if it takes a little while to shut down then you know you're not actually using it unless you want to shut down and get back in quickly then it does take a little bit of time to do that loop uh if you're like restarting your computer or something along those lines uh but you can assign it for a public ip be after the fact so if you decide to make you know you didn't want to have a public IP right off the bat, but then later on the road you decided you wanted one, you can do that. In, effect, in addition to that, you can't upgrade. You can't upgrade right now because it's still shutting down. So the uh, new machine I just created uh, during this video has now been shut down. So now you have a couple uh, options to upgrade. You can change the billing from hourly to monthly and vice versa, of course. And then you can also change the machine type. So I created this as an error. Uh, say I want to increase the performance, I'm going to need to do, uh, you know, some CAD work, 3D CAD. So I'm going to increase it to the, the Pro for a little while and run in Pro while I, while I need that. I'll run in Pro, I'll change it. Uh, it'll take a little bit of time to change that over, but I'll switch to, to Pro. And I'll do my CAD work and then I can switch it back to Air later when I just need to access one or something along those lines. Uh, in addition, you can, oops, clicked off that, you can upgrade your storage. Uh, you can't downgrade the storage after you've already upgraded those. So keep that in mind. 
if you need to downgrade the storage later down the road and don't want to pay, you know, the increased cost, especially like the increased cost between the terabyte, you know, 500 gigs to the terabyte, uh, which is the $15 price, you know, $10 price increase between the two or $20 price increase between one terabyte and two terabyte. Uh, if you don't want to pay that monthly, you know, large monthly fee and want to downgrade to like 250 again, you'll have to delete your machine, reinstall everything on, on a new machine. So just keep that in mind uh, and be, you know, conservative, I guess, on your upgrades. Uh, one final thing, uh, going to go ahead and launch into the uh, pro plan since it's already on. Uh, and as you can see, oh wait, I think I shut that one down. All right, sorry, shutting it down. Let's real quick, let's launch into the standard. All right, so I had that in the desktop app. So as you can see, I can quickly jump in between the desktop app and the uh, web browser. I was doing some benchmarks. I'll probably have a video on that later, uh, but I started doing some benchmarks, but I had that open my desktop, which is on another monitor. I can quickly switch between theirs. I can actually say, yes, close the other connections, load that back, back in my desktop app, and then a, the, the desktop app will just say, yeah, yes, close other applications or other connections. And then I can go back very seamlessly, very quickly. Once you've opened it the first time, you can seamlessly jump between the two, the desktop app and the browser very quickly. So where I see that potentially being useful is in a, you know, a conference type setting where you have, you know, you wanted to switch between a couple different computers very quickly. Uh, somebody, you know, like you want, you're going between two people on their, their morning report or something along, along those lines. You can, people have the stuff prepared on their desktop, pull it up, ready to go while someone else is talking. And then they can switch their, the, your desktop real quickly to that person's cloud computer have it up real quickly, bam, it's there. And then you move on to the next person, a very fluid thing. You don't have to wait on people to pull their data up on that they wanted to talk about in the morning report or something along those lines. And that's just a uh, thing in my everyday life that I could see definitely improved uh, for work. Uh, so real quick, show off a couple of the very cool features. I'm already showing off one of the cool features which is running in the browser. But here is multi-monitor support. Uh, so, here are some of the very cool things and kind of running through in this video. This video is getting a little bit longer. It's going to be like a 30 minute video probably. Uh, but for those who have bared with me, thanks for doing so. But so essentially ease of use, the price uh, uh, and pri price to performance ratio and the price competitiveness, the, those are the first two. And then the ability to run in the browser, which makes it very versatile. And then multi-monitor support. They only have support for two monitors at this time, but it is very cool. You can, I'm only recording off a single monitor. I don't have uh, crap. Uh, whenever you shake a window in Windows, it minimizes all the other windows. So that's why everything went away real quick. But as you can see, I'm running two different apps. Normally you'd run that in another screen, of course, but it does greatly improve the performance or, or your productivity in a cloud environment. Uh, so for example, you could have a, you know, a, your MacBook plugged into a display dock and have a screen that may have your email loading on your MacBook Pro, have that on the Mac's, Mac Pro screen. You have two external monitors pulled up in your desk, big, you know, 4K monitors or something along those lines. Have those pulled up on your desktop and have your, your have, have two of those being cloud computers, very high performance computers that you can, you know, run the cloud. It could be the Pro plan that's upgraded to Wazoo that would kill, you know, a, any type of battery, you know, when you're actually being mobile in like an hour or two, you know, that's a big problem boom with like a gaming laptop. I've tried, ha I've bought one in the past. Uh, don't do a lot of gaming anymore, not near as much as I used to, but the battery life on those things killed me and the weight, but I was okay to deal with the weight, you know, uh, it could pack the weight. The weight didn't bother me as much, but the battery life is killer. Essentially, if you're going to be playing a game, you'll be plugged in. So it kind of killed some of the productivity of this or the the, the benefit, I guess, of a lab, gaming laptop as opposed to just lugging your desktop over to your buddy's house if you wanted to game. I mean, it's a little bit easier uh, than carrying a desktop and a screen. But, I mean, if you're still plugged in, you stroke somewhat constrained. You're not fully portable. With this, you offload all the performance, all the power sucking to the cloud, to the data centers. And then your laptop is going to be able to perform 
and have a battery life for a much longer period of time than it would if it was actually performing all these computing tasks locally. So just a lot of cool features. Uh, and I will demonstrate the USB one later on. I want to do a lot of extensive testing with that with different devices and see what all is compatible. Uh, but that's pretty much it for this video, guys. If you actually hung around for this whole video, uh, thank you. Uh, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, give the video a big like if you liked it. I will have a lot more content on paper space in, in the near future. Uh, so if you did like it, subscribe and hit that little bell icon. That'll make you notified when I do release new videos. Once again, thanks for watching this video, guys. Uh, check out the links in the description or in the little banner that rotates. Uh, and check me out on Twitter, Facebook, uh, or leave comments below if you want to contact me. In addition, if you do like the content that I am producing through Thought Profing Tech, please uh, consider going to Patreon and uh, becoming my patron. Once again, thanks for watching, guys.